Welcome to the mind. What do we really mean by genius? Matters. Giftedness is so much more than an academic label. Podcast. We tend to think of gifted as kids being good at everything across the board. An exploration of giftedness. Originals are nonconformists. Creativity. People who not only have new ideas. Intelligence. They're the people you want to bet on in childhood. They like to learn about things, but I like to learn my way. And beyond. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. Hey everyone, thanks for listening. We're here for our second episode. We had great feedback from our discussion with Kate Bakhtel last time. If you have a subject you'd like us to cover, or if you just have a comment about something that you've heard on the show, feel free to reach out to us. Our Twitter handle is at MindMattersPod. You can go to Facebook.com slash MindMattersPodcast, or go to our website, MindMattersPodcast.com. Today, we're talking with Brandon Tessers and Mark Talaga from the Center of Identity Potential in Detroit and Chicago about video gaming. After our conversation with Brandon and Mark, we'll check in with our panel of experts, a group of kids and parents who are going to share with us their thoughts about gaming. We'll also have some ideas on how you can set healthy guidelines for your family about video games. So again, thanks for joining us for the second episode of the Mind Matters podcast. The Mind Matters podcast recognizes organizations who help gifted children thrive. One of these organizations is the National Association for Gifted Children. NAGC supports those who enhance the growth and development of gifted and talented children through education, advocacy, community building, and research. We invite you to visit giftednessknowsnoboundaries.org and join NAGC's movement to see, understand, teach, and challenge gifted and talented children from all backgrounds. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. Brandon and Mark, welcome. Thank you so much for being part of this today. Um, We'll be talking about video games and giftedness. And I thought maybe we could kind of start off, um, you know, just by thinking about where we started in terms of video games. I mean, I know when I was growing up, we were talking like Oregon Trail and Carmen San Diego. That was definitely my life sitting in the we got, you know, our 30 minutes of computer lab time on the computer with the green and black screen. And we would, you know, People dying of dysentery. Uh, yes, dying of dysentery. It was always, always very tragic. And, you know, I know my parents, for example, though, this was also at a time time where my parents absolutely refused to buy any video game system for us as kids. I was desperate for one. Um, they they were adamant. I was the oldest child. Of course, by the time my brother came along, who was nine years younger, he had any video game system he would he would have liked. What about you guys? What were some of your experiences with video games as as a kid? Well, I um, you know, I, I was into games from a very early age. I can still remember kind of unwrapping the, you know, the NES Nintendo Entertainment System on Christmas. And I was very young. So my relationship with video games started very early. And I was in one of those uh, positions where my two cousins who were my right around my same age that were in the same neighborhood as me uh, also were into games. So it was like what bonded the three of us. And that was that was it. So it progressed from there to Sega to Super Nintendo to PlayStation 2 to, uh, you know, all these different. So I've, you know, to the point where it was such a part of my life that I, you know, went into it as a profession, um, you know, before I do what what I'm doing now. Uh, But, you know, so, yeah, I I worked in the video game industry. um, Cool. uh, So I worked at Midway Games and Capcom and then a Chicago company called Jellyvision Games. And um, so it's always been a real big part of my life. Although now that I'm doing the work that I'm doing, working with the gifted, I I play very little. (laughs) I don't have much time anymore. Uh, (laughs) Right. It's it's always, I mean, I was kind of a a big nerd in that that respect. Yeah, that was a big part of your life. What about you, Brandon? Yeah, well, I mean, I've heard our whole generation referred to as the Oregon Trail generation. Right. Um, (laughs) Because we kind of... We grew up with video games and video games grew up with us. You know, I think I even played like the original Atari Pitfall that somebody had. And same with Mark, still play every once in a while. I, I bought Shadow of War a couple of weeks ago. I had to justify it to myself. Like I can play this an hour a week or so. But yeah, no, I have always enjoyed video games. Been a big way for me to bond with friends for sure. Even as recently as several years ago, I was into online stuff and uh, <clears throat> not as much time anymore. Just like right. just like Mark's saying. I know, adulting. It's like a whole thing. I know. I liked how you kind of phrased that, Brandon, about how video games have kind of grown up with us too. How would how would you say that video games have kind of changed since we have grown up? I mean, the culture of video games is just such a different world. I think. 
um, than what we maybe expected or anticipated when we were young or maybe what our parents expected. So what are some of the things that you've noticed? The, the big change for me that I've seen is how games went from being something you would play in the same room together uh, to something that that is not even an option in most you know, AAA titles anymore. Um, to playing with somebody next to each other. So while gaming has become more pervasive and more players are doing it and there's there's communities and forums and subcultures around it, um, it does feel like it gets more and more disconnected uh, as the games are ju- just by the nature of how they're being made. Yeah, definitely. Kind of ironically, at the same time, I think the social component is becoming more important. Even though you're not face-to-face with people anymore, you have... There was no such thing as a gaming clan or a team or professional esports when I was young. So now we have clients or kids who are playing with people who are their best friends that they've never met in person. And it's this weird situation to end up in where parents don't know who their kids are spending time with. And yet it's important for the kids. That's definitely a big part of the change. And I'd say the, the biggest for sure. One of the things that I notice along those lines with my clients quite often is that they do play these um, these video games with friends from school or family members who are out of town or even possibly that they've never met before. Are we losing something from the lack of in-person communication? Is this replacing this? How do you feel like it's impacting kids in general as they're growing up, just this shift in what those peer relationships look like? Yeah, we could do a whole hour just on that. It Are we losing something? Definitely, because we're not face to face. So we're losing the physical, you know, nonverbal communication, learning how to read each other's faces and bodies. Absolutely. Uh, Is it replacing it? That I don't know. You know, one of the weird things about the Internet in general, not just gaming, is that anything that you have interest or passion about, you can find others who share that and you can find enough resources that you can spend way more time into that than you could have 20 years ago, which particularly affects our gifted kids who have such passions that, you know, I have a client who checks the weather and looks into weather for hours every day in different parts of the world that wouldn't have been possible a long time ago. You know, I, I kind of think of it in terms of opportunity cost. I don't know that the relationships themselves are harmful. In fact, I think that there can be a lot of benefit from them. But if you spend all your time there, then you lose time to have face-to-face relationships and you do lose something. I think it's in, in some ways, for example, my clients who have a lot of social anxiety and have a hard time getting to know people, or perhaps some of my twice exceptional clients who are maybe on the autism spectrum, the video games give them a real opportunity to socialize that maybe they wouldn't have had before. However, one of the things about, for example, anxiety, I always am talking to my clients, like the number one thing that anxiety wants you to do is avoid the thing that causes anxiety. So I'm not sure how much of that is enabling them. You know, on the one hand, they are developing the social relationships. However, there are real life situations that they're not having the experiences with because perhaps this is substituting for that. Well, it's what's the what's the real issue here? Because anxiety and social anxiety specifically is is really a symptom a symptom of a lack of skill of interacting in a way that's pleasing and makes you feel comfortable and, you know, gives you confidence and that kind of a thing. So, you know, when you're gaming and you automatically have something that you're chatting about that, you know, so you're an expert in this, uh, you know, the person is also into that. So it's like, you're, you're kind of doing it to use a gaming term on easy mode in some ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those connections are still very real. I do believe that, but there is an avoidance uh, not due to the anxiety, but the anxiety is, is getting caused from the real issue, which to me is is a, is a skill issue to where they're not dealing with building up what they need to interact in a way that's that's meaningful for them and helpful for them. And, and then on top of that, with giftedness, you are already basically disenfranchised out of the norm. So there's a belief that there's no way for me to do this and nobody's going to understand me and I'm going to come off as weird or quirky or whatever it is. So it's, it's a tricky situation, but I think it's important to realize like what the real, to me, what the real issue is. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. I like that analogy of on easy mode, right? It does provide an opportunity to practice that skill set. And I think you're exactly right. It's like what those are lagging skills that we need to work on and and then using it as a tool. If I have somebody who comes in 
and the thing that they love and that they're passionate about and that they really want to talk about are video games. I have to speak their language. How do we connect with kids to help them develop those skills and, um, you know, use that as a way to facilitate conversation? So, for example, one of the things that that I've done sometimes with clients is help them to create their own video game characters to face whatever struggle it is that they might be facing, whether that's interpersonal relationships or Um, you know, managing homework or stress. And so then we'll kind of like draw it out and we'll talk about, you know, what skills or abilities or strengths or weaknesses does this character have and how would this character overcome their obstacles? Mm. How do you integrate that passion for video games into your work with gifted kids? How do you help them use that as as a strength? So what you're talking about is great. And in fact, if they play role playing games, especially MMOs, where they already have avatars or characters, you can ask those same kind of questions about the characters that they've already formed connection with rather than creating one. Um, I also do family therapy and sometimes I will make the suggestion that the family go home and set aside 15 minutes for the child to teach the parent the video game. So we do it as kind of a role reversal process where the kid gets to be the expert, the parent gets to be the novice, And we have to practice everything as the expert. You have to really take into consideration where the other person is in their development. Think about what's appropriate or not appropriate. I always, when I give it, I always tell the experience of when I tried to get my wife to play portal two with me, which if you're not familiar with the game, it's it's great. A lot of gifted kids love it. It's all about placing portals in different places, not violent and jumping through walls and ceilings. And I got frustrated because I was saying, Susan, just put a portal up on the ceiling there. And she couldn't do it for a couple minutes until finally I realized I I looked at her and she's really running into the corner. And it occurred to me, okay, not only does she not know where the ceiling is or how to place a portal there, she doesn't know how to use two joysticks, one to control the camera and one to control her body. So she doesn't know what she's looking at. So it's a nice perspective taking thing. They get to display some competence. Video games probably could be a really good tool for perspective taking just because a lot of times you do have to put yourself in the position of that character or thinking about what the other characters are doing. Do you see that in some of those video games or in how kids perceive them and use them? This this is going to be a weird like call out to game developers because games nowadays and the more independent indie kind of games are very story driven, are very much about tackling real issues and having almost really intense kind of taboo storylines that um, deal with stuff like suicide or cancer or death or loneliness or whatever it is. And there's really a lot of perspective taking that can go on by playing those games. And I think developers can utilize that a little more since there is a a call for those type of games to play um, that can, that can create alternate um, perspectives. But, you know, even in, in the therapeutic sense, um, yeah, you can you can use that as a jumping off point. You can use it as a way to establish a relationship with somebody. But, you know, the end goal would be, can you translate the fantasy part of it, which is what it is, into something that you really want in your your everyday life? Right. Yeah, and aside from whether we as adults can use it in, a, in that way, that's part of the appeal for anybody who's playing these kinds of games where you're, because not all games involve taking on somebody else's character, but... If you do, that's part of the appeal is that you get to explore that alternate identity to be the hero or whatever. And and I think this goes to your earlier question, too, about how games have grown up. There's a lot of really great artistic games out there. I think Mark's referring to games like To the Moon and Braid that people might not know about. Mm-hmm. I've heard of To the Moon. Yeah, You know, it's not all just shoot 'em ups and zombies. What would you say is the relationship between gaming and giftedness? I mean, is there a unique connection there that drives Um, kids who have high ability to video games, um, perhaps for either different reasons or with more intense passion than their than their non gifted counterparts or or not necessarily. I can speak to that. Um, It's it's, um, you know, it's interesting. We always say that for the gift for the gifted population, the simple is complex and the complex is simple. Um, And I feel that because of the you know, there is complexity to playing games and understanding games and being very good at games uh, that, that does come naturally to gifted people, gifted kids too. But um, so there's a draw in the sense that there is a kind of a quick path to mastery. And I think for a gifted individual, there is always a draw to doing something very well to almost going over the top and being the best you could possibly be. And I think that that's, that's definitely a huge appeal for, for really anybody, but for gifted people, especially 
the issue becomes when w- they put all their eggs in that basket and they just rely on that talent and mastery as their only form of competency or their only form of connection or their only form of whatever. Uh, but I, I think it's like it's it's why they're drawn to it, but mm. it's also the trap that keeps them there. And if you think on a neurophysiological level, neurobiological level, a good game is going to occupy your entire working memory so you won't be bored. Whatever's going on, whatever your level of capability, it's like an automatic way of kicking in the Peter principle that if you play a competitive game like Dota or League of Legends or Overwatch, then you will play that and use the maximum amount of your abilities and experience no boredom and still have more to go because you won't be the best in the world no matter what. Whereas at school, there's a cap. And if you are successful in this class, you know, and don't have anything, any extra room to grow, that's where the boredom starts to kick in. I find that that's really fascinating to think about how for gifted kids, the video games can provide the challenge that maybe they're not getting in the school setting. And I also really found it interesting when you were just talking about the working memory piece, because I do notice that a lot of the people that I work with, especially those kiddos who are twice exceptional with an ADHD diagnosis, those are the kids who get very into those video games, it seems like, and, and, and sometimes have a very hard time transitioning out of them. You get those parents who say, oh, they can't focus on anything. And then two seconds later say, oh, but they play video games for five hours at a time. Well, the interesting thing about that is, you know, when you when you have an area of high interest, whether that's a, you know, a subject in school or whether that is just video games, you are going to kind of bypass and short circuit any sort of gaps you may have, you know, whether that's an executive function or processing speed or working member or whatever, and you're going to perform at a high level. So games by design are, you know, really great at, you know, providing structure and teaching somebody how to play the game and then reinforcing the, the skills you're learning and then broadening out those skills to other areas. And for a kid who may be twice exceptional with an ADD diagnosis, Um, they're all about having structure, but things moving really quickly, uh, but not leaving them behind. And and games are just kind of really, really good at that. So they're, they're, their brains are really working at full capacity when they're playing games. The problem is when they're presented with something that isn't necessarily of high, uh, an area of high interest, it's like their learning profile goes back to having those gaps in it. So they're not really interested, not not that they're interested in material. They're not interested in dealing with what it's going to take to address those gaps when video games kind of, you know, short circuit the whole thing. Yeah, that effort that it takes to maintain that attention, to have that task initiation and all of those other executive functioning skills. There's a lot of effort that goes into that. And I think people who don't struggle with that don't always have the same awareness of how difficult that can be for them. Right, exactly. Especially, you know, because a kid's executive function is underdeveloped until they're about 25 to 28 years old. So you have an adult that's like, I don't understand, you know, what the issue is. Well, put it in terms of a neurophysiological issue rather than, oh, they're just lazy or they're just not trying or whatever. They just want to play video games because they're da 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 Right. It's like, well, right. look at it from a brain perspective and it might shift how you deal with it. Yeah, if you need executive functioning support, which all kids do to some extent, uh, but especially twice exceptional and gifted kids do, imagine if, take a look at their favorite video game and look at the user interface and imagine if you had that following you around all the time. Oftentimes it'll have quests tracked on the screen so you know and it checks off when you accomplish it. You'll have a glowing white line leading you literally the steps you're supposed to take from thing to thing. Uh You'll have some easy way of tracking what resources you have available to you, whether they've been used recently or not. You know, all the things that an executive functioning coach would work with a kid, breaking things down into smaller chunks so that you get that sense of completion and satisfaction step by step rather than one large task. The games do it. That is such an amazing um, example. Again, the light bulb is going off for me because when I'm talking with parents and trying to give them tools and tips, I'm kind of telling them all of these same things and kind of coaching the kids through. And quite often, and I understand this as a parent, parents struggle with they don't understand sometimes how I told my child to do this thing. I told them how to do it. Why aren't they doing it? And so so breaking it down into those more basic steps 
um, sometimes I think is frustrating for the parents. But using that paradigm of the video games and understanding this is how this works and this is a support. This is these are tools that we can use. And how can we bring this type of a model into real life to help support these kids until they have those skills developed where they don't need all of that additional support? Yeah. And on top of that, you have situations where they're like, well, they can do it here. They're so good at it at this thing. Mm -hmm. But at this thing, it's just they're just not listening to me. And sometimes there's an assumption that if they can do, you know, X, Y and Z in situation one, that it should be applied to any situation. But really, sometimes you do have to take a step back and break it down, be like, maybe there is a, a skill gap here. Uh, and, and there is some need to really break it down and, you know, and perhaps just giving instructions in a verbal sense, if you're dealing with a kid that maybe has auditory processing issues is, is not going to be the only way you, you really do have to think about it in a bigger in a way. And you do have to break it down. Yeah. More comprehensive assessment. Mm -hmm. It's not just successful or not successful. You got to break it down. It's nuanced. So a lot of my clients really like the game, the Pokemon card game, because it has all of these rules and all of this structure and you have to follow this particular pattern pattern. And I feel like uh, there's a translation there to those video games. I feel like sometimes kids feel that's kind of a safe experience because they know what to expect. And in real life, a lot of times when we do see behaviors that are coming out, maybe resulting from some underlying anxiety or insurity or perfectionism or whatever, part of that is just not knowing what to expect. And so video games kind of give them that safe place to kind of explore those things and kind of take chances and risks. Sure. And I would build on what Mark said earlier about all of that being symptomatic, because what we're really talking about is processing that's not keeping up with comprehensive abil comprehension abilities. So a lot of our gifted kids can imagine, comprehend, dream at an incredibly high level, and then their processing, even if it's normal or even above average, doesn't keep up with that. So they need to develop frameworks in order to operate at their highest level to operate at the level at which they know they're capable they need to know what's coming so video games or board games any kind of games that have strict parameters and rules once i learn all that it's something that i can hold easily in my mind and i can really fly so you'll you'll see these kids who love to learn a new game because they get the rules quickly and then they can really go off with the strategy and access all of that higher stuff they don't have to process every moment yeah I, I love that. And, and I want to build off that because it's not even for gifted kids. This is gifted people. Anybody that has gaps oh, yeah. in their their learning profile. You know, I, I think of the example where, you know, um, sometimes I'll have a phone call that I need to make that I will be putting off. Now, I know how to make a phone call. I made, you know, millions of phone calls in my life. That's not the <laughs> issue. And so my anxiety is way through the roof and I don't know why. But when I start to talk it out and process it, I realize I don't have a framework for what I'm about to go into for whatever this phone call is. So, you know, we'll call, I usually, I, I call the founder of our company, Andy, who's, who's, you know, our mentor and he'll walk me through what, you know, what my intention is, what I'm trying to do, what, what I'm trying to accomplish, uh, what the relationship is in that phone call. And he breaks it into a framework. So all of a sudden my anxiety goes way down because anxiety is a symptom uh, and I'll be able to make that phone call. Now, games are great because games automatically build in that structure because they have, you know, millions of dollars of, of development money for the bigger games going into having that structure built in. But it's so key and it's why games are so tantalizing because they, they, they have a structure, but there's a complexity to it that gifted kids really like because they can understand it at a deeper level. And like Brandon said, they can fly. That's why businesses and schools are looking at gamification of non-game oriented tasks. You structure it that way and it works better. By the way, if you have any clients or kids that you know who are incredibly rigid about rules who will get very dysregulated if people are acting inappropriately around them, not following the rules, or if they tattle, then oftentimes this is that same thing. I needed to know what to expect. You're changing the rules on me. Now I know I won't be able to do what I'm capable of, and I'm freaking out about it. Do you find that um, high ability children and teens and, and adults, do the same kinds of video games appeal to them as their neurotypical counterparts? Or would you say that there's some, some variation there? I guess I'll say yes and no. In the same way with reading, where neurotypical and a gifted kid might appreciate the same reading. But anecdotally, I do see a lot more in reading sci-fi and fantasy. Uh, in gaming, I tend to see a lot more of the more complex and the more uh, role-playing game-oriented ones where you have more in-depth. And I, I think it speaks to 
if I'm reading a fantasy book or a sci-fi book, or if I'm playing an in-depth role-playing game, I am not capable of holding everything about that created world in my mind at once. So no matter how much I can hold, I, I can still fill it up. Whereas a simple like Candy Crush might not really occupy my brain. In fact, it doesn't. I hated Candy Crush. <laughs> I, I may have gone through a Candy Crush phase, but... Uh... And, you know, it's funny. I, I went through it and I was like, oh, I got really far or whatever. And then I find out recently that my mom has been playing Candy Crush, which is hilarious to me. And I'm like, oh, what level are you on? She's like, oh, I don't know, like 1,640. I'm like, what? Right. <laughs> like, which is unheard of. And, you know, it's funny. She, <laughs> she says to me, she goes, now I really relate to you when you were a kid and you and I was calling you to come to dinner how hard it is to stop in the middle of something. And I'm like, yeah. Right. Interesting to know that people don't realize that more women are gamers than men. And the average, uh, the average gamer in America right now is a 33 year old woman uh, in a large part because of those mobile games and those kinds of things. Where is that fine line? Where is that breaking point when a video game passion becomes a video game addiction. I don't know, you know, if you've seen that and can address that specifically. Well, we are going to throw an intervention for my mom. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> it's getting pretty bad. It's going to come around Christmas time. But, you know, the first thing I'll say about that is um, in our work, we don't deal with true addiction. It's outside of our scope. So you'd have to kind of lean on more of a, an addiction expert to really get into this. But um, that line can get crossed for sure. I think that line is blurry for a lot of people and it is not well defined and no one really agrees on what it looks like. If I was spending 10 hours a week playing video games right now, I'd be neglecting my job and my family. That would be problematic and speak to addiction. But if a kid who's at college plays 10 hours a week, that might be totally appropriate. There's a out there it's called the young internet addiction test that i like to use as a reference but it's going to ask the same basic questions about addiction do you continue to engage in the behavior even though you want to stop does engaging in the behavior negatively significantly negatively impact your relationships your work those kinds of things but it is going to be a case-by-case -case basis we can't say like oh x number of hours per week or anything is problematic and i think also it's hard when we're talking about school-aged children well, if it's interfering with their homework, but they're not motivated to do their homework, is it a video game problem or is it a homework problem? Like, what are we really, you know, dealing with? We're of the mindset that nine times out of 10, and I shouldn't even give a stat, but it, more often than not, uh, it is not a video game problem. A video game, a video game increase is symptomatic of a learning issue, right? Of something mm -hmm. that they're going through. Where again, deep assessment is or comprehensive assessment is is necessary, um, but there's something that they are struggling with, to where they are avoiding and putting it off and then kind of going to their unconscious default mode of just gaming because it's something they're good at, something they enjoy, um, something that kind of takes them out of it. Yeah. So tell me about the bell curve for asynchronicity and how it applies to video gaming, because it's definitely a term that um, I'm, I'm curious to find out more about. You know, really, you know, the term, the bell curve of asynchronicity um, uh, should be, you know, is was coined by uh, the founder of our company, um, Andy Mahoney. Um, and it's really it's it's something that unifies a lot of the work that we do where um, you you put intelligence as a factor where the, the, the more a person is gifted, the more they are in the extreme of development and whatever that is, whether that's academically, whether that's artistically, whether that's physically gifted, what you know, whatever that is, the farther they are out on the bell curve typically the more scatter they have in their profile. So they have larger gaps. Everybody has gaps, but with a gifted person, those gaps can be a lot larger and, and go from, you know, less than a standard deviation apart to three standard deviations apart, which is highly significant. Um, and within those gaps lies a lot of issues and a lot of problems. If you have a person that is has a lot of gaps that are undiagnosed and, un, and not understood and there's no assessment that's been done, you're going to have a lot of symptomology coming out of that, whether that's a mood disorder or whether that's oppositional stuff, behavioral things, uh, or whether that's heavy levels of gaming. Um, but but the, the gaps are related to gaming when gaming becomes you know, leans more towards not being very healthy, not, not creating, you know, healthy identities in your life. Um, so it's like the, the root of that though, is the asynchrony is the gaps. 
So when you're looking at, at gaming, when you're looking at anything, when you're looking at any behavior, you have to put in the, with a gifted person, especially you have to put those gaps onto the, the playing field. No, I, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Just kind of extrapolating that that concept of asynchronous development and how that impacts in such a variety of ways through the lifespan and, you know, how we kind of view the development of the gifted individual. Yeah, we talk about the things that bother you the most. It's often a sign of ability. You know, it, it bothers me not at all that I don't paint well, probably means I don't have it in me to be a great painter. Uh, it bothers me quite a bit that I've never written a novel, which which is a sign to me that if I get things figured out and write that novel, there's something in me that's telling me that, that I can do that. That's a good fit for who I am. One piece of feedback that I hear from parents, and I think we kind of talked about this a little bit already, but having trouble getting their child to transition from playing a video game Um, to another activity or the draw is so great to go back and go back to that game um, that like, for example, my children sometimes will forego eating a full meal. I'm not hungry. I'm I'm done eating so that they can go back and, and get back on, you know, the video game. So what are some general guidelines and rules that parents can kind of use to help create a healthy framework for their families, you know, to set those boundaries, but also allow those opportunities and privileges that come along with gaming. You use the the word framework, which I like. And and the big key is do it ahead of time because there's a lot going on that parents might not be plugged in on. You might not understand what a raid is and why it's important if your kid is his guild's main healer that he can't leave in the middle of a raid and what that would have social consequences, right? That doesn't get discussed in the moment. It just turns into an argument and everybody gets heated and the prefrontal cortex shuts down and and everyone's really not listening anymore. So it does need to be done ahead of time and it does need to be done family by family. To some families, it's important that we have a rule that at the table, at the dinner table, nobody's on any electronics whatsoever. Other families don't have that opportunity and maybe it doesn't matter as much. Um, The American Association of Pediatricians actually where that dreaded no screen time from zero to two rule came from originally back in 1998 that they've gotten rid of now. They have some great uh, resources. If you go to their website, their new recommendations aren't recommendations like they used to be. Instead, it's frameworks. It's uh, worksheets for families to talk through with each other about what do we think about this? What do we think about this? What are some rules that work for our family? And then, of course, like anything else, once the frameworks are put up, they have to be consistently applied. Otherwise, especially with a gifted kid, if they know that it's not consistent, they will find a way to make it inconsistent in their favor. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, you know, the, I like the phrase strike when the iron's cold. You know, if, you, if you're doing it in the that. moment and you're ga- and engaging in a power struggle, uh, you're in trouble. That's a tough one. Uh, and like Brandon was saying, if it's really heated, then your limbic system's taking over your brain, your prefrontal cortex is shutting down, you're not processing anything, good luck. You know, it's 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 tough. Right. So it is about being strategic, dealing with it either before, ideally before, but also after, you know, this is what I've been sure. noticing. Um, but But having a conversation involving the kid in helping with the solution, if they're able to do that. Uh, and then if it's, but if it's getting to a point where that isn't working and it's escalating and it's getting out of control, then maybe you need a little extra support and help. Maybe you call somebody, you know, you, well, like one of us to, to come in and, and help mediate and, and start to understand what's going on. An easy rule of thumb is the more you, the more times you've argued about something, the more likely you are when it comes up, even when it's not an issue to slip back into argument because you've trained yourself to be in that mode. And this is where we end up with parents who destroy their children's laptops. I've had multiple parents who've gotten into fights so heated that they're throwing laptops in the sink. I've had kids who, after their computer was taken away, threatened suicide. Or one one particular guy who went and took all the kitchen knives and stabbed them into the hallway wall in the shape of an obscene word. Um, So yeah, the, the more that this has happened, the less likely you are to be able to handle it on your own. So after a certain point, go see somebody. Mark Delaga and Brandon Tessers from the Center for Identity Potential with offices in Detroit and Chicago. Thank you so much for being here. Sure. People can reach you via your website, which is centerforidentitypotential.com. And we'll, of course, have links for that in the program notes for all of you listening. We'd love to have you guys back again soon. Thanks for having us. It was great. This is the Mind Matters Podcast.
So for those of you who'd like to kind of work on guidelines for creating a healthy family atmosphere for video gaming, here are a couple of ideas from our conversation. First, determine a framework ahead of time and agree on boundaries for video games. Our family has found it helpful to use a program that can automatically set time limits and schedules for when it's okay to play video games and when it's not. This helps us to remove the parent-child power struggle when it is time to turn the video games off. It's called Family Link and is for Android tablets and phones. We'll put a link in the program notes. And finally, don't forget to use video games as a bonding activity with your child. Let them be the expert and teach you their game. Enter their world with them. By understanding the draw of video gaming for high-ability kids, parents, teachers, and counselors can use gaming as a framework for understanding why these games make some kids tick. It provides them an ongoing challenge they may not be getting at school. It provides measurable benchmarks and goals where they can track their progress and see how they are improving. And it can give kids an emotionally safe way to connect with their peers. And now, let's hear from the Mind Matters panel of experts. My favorite video game is probably Pokemon Ultra Sun. Probably Mario Kart 7. I really, really like Pokemon. A game on the Xbox Battlefront. A lot of Nintendo games, actually. I like Minecraft and Run Sausage Run. I don't play video games. I don't like them. I like... Geometry Dash Sub Zero. No, all I do is iMovie. And you play it with different players like around the world. I really, really love the cute little characters. You get to collect them and name them. They're kind of blank slates and you get to assign kind of personalities to them, almost like pets in a way. <laughs> I really like it when I earn coins and it keeps saying stuff in speech bubbles while I'm playing. There are a lot of cool levels on the game and it's just like complicated, so so I like it like that. If you have other stuff to do and you spend most of your free time on video games, it's probably not a good thing. I think we, it should be able to play two hours of video games. Probably like an hour. I'm not really sure. Two hours. I don't know. I think I can find better things to do outside. Two hours per day. Oh, about 18 hours. Really, it's all kind of about being away from the parents, if you know what I mean. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and I've got some Pokemon to catch, so I'll see you next time. I may be different, but my love is just the same. My lies if they hit the fan. So give me a reason, a reason not to shine as brightly as I can. As brightly as Thanks for listening to the Mind Matters Podcast with Emily Kircher Morris. To learn more about us and our mission, go to mindmatterspodcast.com. If you'd like to show your support for Mind Matters, find us in Apple iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe and leave us a positive review. Start a discussion and follow us on Twitter at Mind Matters Pod or on Facebook at facebook.com slash mindmatterspodcast. Help spread the word about the Mind Matters Podcast. Mind Matters is a production of Morris Creative Services.